The hand is an organ which performs extremely delicate and complicated movements. Without the hand, the history of mankind would not have been created. In this movie, you will see the function of the hand and some important points in the diagnosis when the function of the hand is impaired. They say that the ancestors of the man were apes. The biggest difference between the hands of these two creatures is the function of the thumb. Even in chimpanzees, the thumb is short and does not completely oppose against the fingers. He is able to make side pinch, but no tip pinch. The thumb of the man can oppose against the other fingers. This motion brings forth very delicate and exquisite movements of the hand. With abduction and rotation, the thumb comes to the position of opposition. This movement is done by opponent's pollicis muscle, innervated by the median nerve. When the median nerve is paralyzed, the thumb becomes unable to oppose. Since the hand looks like an ape's hand, this is called ape hand deformity. This is a hand of a patient with a median nerve paralysis. It may appear almost normal. But if you compare the hand with the normal hand, you will see definite inability of opposition, although some abduction of the thumb is present. This is an important finding in median nerve paralysis. Next is the extension and flexion of the IP joint of the thumb. This is done by the extensor pollicis lungs and the flexor pollicis lungs muscles. This patient has a division of the extensor pollicis lungs tendon. The IP joint cannot be extended in this position, but it can be extended when the thumb is abducted. Two reasons for this. One is the fact that the extensor pollicis brevis and some of the thinner muscles are supplementing the extensor pollicis lungs. The other is a possible adhesion of the tendon stump, which gives a dynamic tenodesis effect to the thumb in abducted position. Thus, active extension of the thumb IP joint does not always exclude the possibility of division of the extensor pollicis lungs tendon. The specific motion of this muscle is demonstrated when one raises the thumb from a table. This is a valuable test for extensor policy lungs function. The thumb and the fingers are aligned to form a transverse arch. When this arch is disrupted, the function of the hand is severely disturbed. In this case, the thumb is not in its position of function. The transverse arch, including the thumb, should be respected when the hand is immobilized. There is also a longitudinal arch in the hand with the joint in slight flexion. This is also important for good function of the hand. The PIP and DIP joints are single axis joints so that they move only in one plane. The NP joints, however, are ball and socket joints which enable the joints to move freely in all directions. The NP joints permit abduction and adduction like this. 
The motion is larger when the joint is in the extension, but it becomes smaller in flexion. This mechanism meets the demand of the hand very nicely. When a hand grips an object, the MP joints become flexed, ensuring less play and better stability. On the contrary, when one plays the piano or typewriter, the MP joints are extended to enjoy free movement. This interesting variable lateral stability of the MP joint is due to eccentric insertion of the collateral ligament, which becomes loose in extension and tight in flexion. When a MP joint is immobilized in extension for a long period of time, the collateral ligaments become contracted and the finger becomes unable to be bent. This patient was treated for callus fracture. The MP joint of the little finger shows a limitation of flexion because the plaster cast has held this joint in extension for a considerable period of time. When the MP joints need to be included in a cast, the joints should be held in somewhat of a flexed position. In this case, the MP joints need not be immobilized, but the joints are actually included in the cast. Let's see where the MP joints are. The MP joints may often be mistaken to be located behind this proximal finger crease, but in fact, it corresponds to this distal palmar crease. In this case, the MP joints are free. Flexion of the MP joints are done by interosseous and lumbrical muscles. The interosseous muscles perform quite a unique movement. A portion of the interosseous fiber attached to the proximal phalanx and acts to abduct and adduct the finger. Remaining portion of fiber blends into the lateral band with the lumbrical muscle and flexes the MP joint. The force is further transmitted dorsally and extends the PIP and DIP joints. All the interosseous muscles and the supported lumbrical muscles to the ring and little fingers are innervated by the ulnar nerve. A textbook would say that ulnar nerve paralysis results in claw hand deformity, but actually only the ring and little fingers go into this deformity. The index and long fingers are spared because the lumbricals going into these fingers are innervated by the median nerve. In ulnar nerve paralysis, abduction and adduction of the fingers become weak because of the paralysis of the interosseous muscles. This is beautifully demonstrated by Froman's test. By pulling a paper held between the thumb and the index finger, the normal hand can resist it, as you see here, but in ulnar nerve paralysis, the IP joint of the thumb and the PIP joint of the index finger bend like this. This phenomenon is caused by compensatory action of the flexors of the thumb and the index finger to replace the weakness of the first daughter interosseus, the adductor pollicis, and the flexor pollicis brevis muscles. This is a patient with ulnar nerve division showing positive Froman's test. Extension of the MP joint of the fingers is done by extensor digitorum calmness muscles 
which are supplied by the radial nerve. This patient has radial nerve paralysis. He is unable to extend the MP joints of the fingers, whereas the PIP and DIP joints can be actively extended. Thus, it is important to remember that the presence of active extension of these small joints does not rule out radial nerve paralysis. The fingers are bent by flexor digital sublimus and flexor digital profundus muscles. The sublimus ends at the middle phalanx and the profundus at the distal phalanx so that a finger can be flexed by a profundus alone. Then why are there flexor sublimi? Flexor sublimus is quite an independent muscle compared to the profundus, so that it gives an independent motion to the finger. This patient has division of a flexor sublimus muscle. The fingers can be flexed like this so that the division of the sublimus tendon can be easily overlooked. In order to examine the action of flexor sublimus, the other fingers are held extended. By doing so, the profundi, which have less independency than the sublimi, are stretched together so that only the sublimus can perform its function to flex the PIP joint. In this patient, the sublimus tendon in the long finger has been divided. Most of the finger flexors are innervated by the median nerve. In this patient, the median nerve has been completely divided at the elbow by a trauma. The ulnar three fingers, however, can be flexed. Why is it? It is explained by the fact that the profundus muscles are innervated by both the median and the ulnar nerve, and that the ulnar nerve supplies the muscles going into the ulnar three fingers. The high median nerve paralysis should be diagnosed by whether the thumb and the index finger can be flexed or not. For the examination of the peripheral nerves, checking of sensory disturbance is also important. Here, one should keep in mind that there is a considerable overlapping in the sensory nerve supply. In order to examine a specific nerve, it is practical to see the sensation in the area of isolated nerve supply where no overlapping is present. The area of isolated supply for the median nerve is the distal portion of the index finger. The denervated skin loses sweating and becomes dry. By checking the moisture of the skin, one can objectively assess the status of the nerve supply. This is quite helpful in examining a child. A finger cannot be flexed when there is adhesion of the flexor tendon to the surrounding tissue. The most familiar one is the adhesion in the so-called no man's land, as you see in this patient. 
the area from the MP joint to the PIP joint, where the sublimus and the profundus tendons are running through a ligamentous tendon sheath, has been called no man's land, where primary tendon suture should be avoided because of potential adhesion. This area roughly corresponds to the Norman's land. Even when an injury appears to have occurred outside the Norman's land, the tendons are sometimes divided in the tendon sheath depending on the position of the finger at the time of the injury. Through the advances of surgical techniques made in recent years, the problems in the primary tendon suture in the Norman's land have been overcome and the Norman's land has become a Sunman's land. This area, however, still remains as a critical area where tendon suture should be performed only by an experienced surgeon with appropriate instruments. There have been tremendous advancements in the surgery of the hand in the past decades. Especially with microsurgery, it enabled us not only to replant amputated fingers, but to transfer a toe to the hand. The restoration of the complicated hand function is not a simple task. functions of the hand are indispensable for the human to carry out his daily activities. For the examination and treatment of the hand, it is imperative for surgeons to have precise knowledge on the functional anatomy of this unique and fine organ of the body.